Cool, okay, all right, thanks. Well, I suppose in terms of talking about students in the class struggle today, I think it's quite interesting to sort of look at what students have been like today and then actually what's also happened in the past as well. Because when you think that in 1926 in Britain, when you had a general strike, students were a part of scabbing on that strike and played a really reactionary role inside of that, which almost seems unimaginable today. When you think back to what the 30th of November strikes were like, um, and we saw the role that students played in that, in terms of being part of the picket lines, in terms of supporting people fighting back. Um, but not just that, I think, as well, but also that when you saw sort of um, opinion polls and surveys of people around what they thought about the 30th of November strikes, um, I think it was the highest, the highest level of support came from young people inside of Britain. I think it was 70% of people between the age of 18 and 26 supported the public sector strikes um, on, the 30th of, uh, on the 30th of November. Um, and it wasn't just so when you, it's weird I think sometimes to think back that there was a time at which students wouldn't have been a part of that, that actually they would have been against it. And it's not just then that you'd seen students being on the side of, uh, on the side of reaction. I think in any situation where you saw the working class coming up against the bourgeoisie, up against the ruling class, um, students had been on the, on the, on the wrong side. Um, so, I mean, you know, when you see, for example, um, in Russia in 1905, for example, where you have actually um, a, a revolution against the sort of czarist regime, the students were with people fighting back. But when you go to 1917 and you actually see it up, come up against the sort of parliamentary and bourgeois system, the students were on the, on, the side of, on the side of reaction. And the same in Germany, 1919 to 1923. Um, but today, obviously, things are very different. And it's really the point at which I think that changed most dramatically was really from the sort of 1960s onwards. Um, and, I mean, the student movements from then onwards, I think, yeah, have looked remarkably different. Um, and I can give you a quote from a guy called Mario Savio, who was a student leader um, in the 1960s. And this is from 1964 <coughs> in, uh, in, Bar in Berkeley in um, California, where um, he is about to, um, he's just heard the university th authorities are threatening to expel him for his role in a demonstration only two months before. And this might be familiar for some of you people here who've been involved in demonstrations and been on the side up against your university managements. But he says, um, if this is affirmed, I think we should shut that door actually. Just mm -hmm. If this is affirmed and the board of regents are the board of directors and President Kerr is in fact the manager, then the faculty are a bunch of employees and we're the raw material. But we're a bunch of material that don't mean to be made into any product don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, we're human beings. There's a time when the operations of the machine become so odious, make you so sick at heart that you can't take part, can't even tacitly take part, and then you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And so you think about it, it's quite a radical speech, I think, that he makes in 64 in Berkeley at the time. And actually, when they had their occupation, the police were sent in, uh, into the sit-in, and students were, were arrested. And this was just a totally unprecedented situation for capitalism to have seen that, to have seen students reacting in that way and actually really sort of almost grinding the education system uh, to, to a halt. But the decade that followed that, actually, I think you just see then the, the contagion almost and the spread of, of, that, of that student movement. So... The occupations that followed were the Free University in Berlin in June 1966, the LSE in March 67, all the major universities in Germany in June 1967, um, Turin, Trento and Milan in autumn of 1967, and then all the Italian universities went into occupation um, in, uh, in, in, 19, in January and February of 1968. Warsaw, the Nantes camp campus of Paris in March 68, Columbia University, New York, every German university in April, the whole of higher education in France in May in 1968, in the UK, Leicester, Essex, Hull, Sussex, Birmingham universities all went into occupation, three colleges of art went into occupation, one of them I'm going to come back onto in a bit, and eventually it came back to the Berkeley campus in California. And in fact, when they did a, a survey in the United States, 
they found that 70% of private universities and 43% of public universities had reported severe student unrest. So, I mean, this was just an incredible movement internationally of the students reacting against the system and the way in which the system was treating them um, and, and was dealing with them. And so 68 is often referred to as the year of the students. I mean, in fact, it was much more than that. <coughs> I mean, there was a really nice um, interview with um, Gil Scott Heron. People know Gil Scott Heron, the guy that the revolution will not be televised. And they did this whole thing. They were talking to him about music and the rest of it. And so they chatted to him about 68 and they called it, they talked to him about the summers of love. And he said, I don't remember any summers of love. I remember summers of struggle. You know, and I think there's a real difference there in terms of the interpretation of what the 60s were about hippies and free love. But actually, these were times of intense struggle, intense struggle, not just with students, but also class struggle, the civil rights movements, the anti-Vietnam War movement. There was a year, really, of massive revolts everywhere. And I think one of my favourite stories, when you want to see the real sort of the way in which people can turn around and transform in these sorts of periods, is when Eldridge Cleaver who was a part of the uh, Black Panther Party, goes to a Catholic school um, to address these nuns who are you know, training nuns or whatever, and he has about 5,000 of these, these students there. And he was doing a campaign against the governor of the state of California at the time, which was Ronald Reagan, who was, you know, obviously went on to be the president of the United States and who was a real reactionary. And Eldridge Cleaver is basically addressing these student nuns. And after about half an hour, he has them all chanting, you know, fuck Ronald Reagan, fuck Ronald Reagan, one, two, three, four, fuck Ronald Reagan. And you just think this in a, a school with people who are trying to learn to become nuns, it just shows you, I think, the way in which the infectiousness of some of that struggle and some of that, so that how that resistance took place. And so there's a question then, isn't there, is how did we go from scabbing in 1926 to being part of this incredible revolt in, uh, in, in 1968? And I think really the key, key to that really is the change in nature of the student body and the change in, way, the, the change in education, that, in education that took place as well. Because, you know, at the turn of this last century, the higher education really was a place for the most privileged uh, people in our, in our society. It was the ruling, children of the ruling class that went to university to be taught by the ruling class as well, you know, I mean, this is a place where really, I mean, you would have had some, maybe some upper middle class people there who might have become, learned to become the lawyers and the civil servants of society, the administrators of the state and so on. But actually in the main, really, it was, uh, it was, was the children of the ruling class. And so I think in Britain in 1900, the total university population was 25,000 students, which when you consider the millions now that are involved in it, it just shows you what a small part of society it was and the, the elite um, and who were there. And really, you know, by and large, what did they study? They studied the classics, you know. I mean, these weren't people who went to university because they had to get a job afterwards. These are people that went because it was a, a time to expand one's ma mind, take part in cultural debates and studies and all these sorts of things as well. But then actually what you see is that the needs of capitalism and the system really change um, after, the, after the Second World War. And you have, you know, a massive uh, expansion of, of the system. Um, I mean, you know, the changing nature of imperialism at the time as well, when we moved away from colonialism, much more towards the sort of manufacturing base that you saw. I mean, obviously, the long boom that happened post-Second World War. I mean, there's a sort of theory of the permanent arms economy, which we look at to explain that. But actually, you see the massive expansion of, of technology and science, its application into industry. Um, all these things really became the key factor for capitalist accumulation uh, post, post the Second World War. <coughs> I mean, it doesn't go straight away. So you have a sort of a slow development in the sense that you have probably, just after the Second World War, about 69,000 students engaged in university education. But actually, it's really by the 1960s that it really starts to take shape. I mean, if you listen to uh, Harold Wilson at the time, I mean, he talked about the white heat of the technological revolution, and therefore we needed that sort of revolution with inside our universities as well. And I don't know if uh, for you or not, but certainly like my parents, for example, were the first of their generation to go to university at that time in the, in the 1960s, previously to that. I mean, this was a real breakthrough for people. You know, the grants that people got. I mean, I always think it was real travesty when the Labour government you know, came in in 97 or whatever, and they not only have we had the ab abolition of grants already, they then introduced the fees, 
And these were the same people who, like my parents, would have been the first in their families to go to university. And what did they do? They pulled the ladder up behind them and try and stop other people uh, um, coming, coming into that. But um, a massive, exp massive expansion. So 1964, 294,000 students in university. Um, and, uh, and really by, so, I mean, if in 1950 you have like almost one and a half percent of the age group at university, 1972, 15 percent of, of, that, of that age group were, were studying um, at university. And so it was a massive expansion of the system. Um, and, you know, there was the idea really of, you know, that you did study um, for study's sake. I would think really the experience of most people at university at that time, even though the system had changed much more towards churning people out into industry, it wasn't just based just at ruling class kids and so on, it was about pushing people into industry, but still there was the space to study, if you like. People weren't constrained by the same things they are today in terms of having to get part-time work, in terms of saddled, being saddled with debt and all those different things as well. Um, um, but again, I do think because they were still aiming for people to move into, um, you know, work afterwards and industry and so on, the what people expected from university or from college, and then what they came up against when they got there, again, actually were quite a different things. So I mean, one of the occupations in in '68 that had happened was at the Hornsey College of Art. And I remember chatting to a guy who was actually at the college when they went into occupation and he'd gone there to study furniture design and so on. And of course everybody got there thinking they were going to be able to develop these beautiful bespoke pieces of furniture, express their creativity, express themselves through this. And what they found was they were being taught how to make flat pack furniture, how to produce stuff for MFI or the IKEA equivalent of today for example. And so people felt like then they were being taught on the basis of mass production techniques on the basis of, of what the e economy wanted and not actually what they wanted. And I think people felt incredibly constrained by the realities of the system and what they, what they had expected. And of course, even for people that ran the universities, things became very different. You know, I mean, they talk about them becoming knowledge factories, basically. They are there to churn out these people to go into to, 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 to the capitalist system. But really, the change as well that you see is, is that it's no longer that you have a situation where the universities are communities of equals, where it's the kids of the ruling class and the teachers the part of the ruling class. You start to then see divisions as well um, in, the, in, in the way that, pe that people were taught and I mean, the way that university lecturers are today as well and the way that university lecturers were then. They almost become proletarianised, if you like. You know, they become much more workers of the system as opposed to these you know, grandees holding up you know, ruling class ideas in, inside, of, inside of society. And of course, you know, the, therefore you, you can see as well the beginnings or the, the, you know, it started to shake shape, the sort of marketisation of, 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 edu of education and so on as well. Um, and I mean, I think it's remarkable today that some of the people with the worst conditions, uh, working conditions, uh, teachers, are university lecturers. They've become so casualised. When you think about what people's contracts are, zero hours contracts and so on, you can see some of those changes taking place, not just in the change in nature of students, but also the staff and the people um, that, are, that, are, that are teaching as well. So I mean, today, you know, we have two and a half million students in the higher education sector alone. I mean, another big change, I think, has been the presence of women inside of universities. I mean, 56% of higher education students today are, are women, you know, which makes it even more the shocking when you think about the levels of sexism on our campuses, because actually there's been incredible changes for women in terms of education, but it's been accompanied uh, also by, um, by, by reaction at the, at the same time. And then, of course, you know, I mean, when we were up in Manchester University last week, and I suppose the same thing would be the case here, we were thinking, you know, if you'd have gone there in the 1980s, Students as students, you would have been protesting about the removal of housing benefit. Uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible to think that you could have got housing benefit, isn't it, in the 1980s? In the 1990s, you would have been campaigning against the removal of grants. In the 1990s, we were campaigning to stop the introduction of fees. Now we're talking about the tripling of fees up to £9,000 per year. So you can see how these things have gone in terms of what the student experience has been and what the experience of, of, of higher education is as well. And so, of course, the reality for students now is, is that poverty and debt really are a real reality for people, obviously, on a day-to-day -day basis. And on top of that, you know, really it is about education for a job. And even now, I think, when you look at the levels of graduate unemployment and so on, you can see the real 
you know, the, the problems that people go through when they do study things that don't necessarily have a vocational type of focus towards them, getting employment afterwards or meaningful employment for people actually um, has, has been a really, has been a, 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 you know, it's been a difficult struggle for people. And so, you know, it has been a long, long time really since, you know, studying was about the classics or just expanding, expanding one's minds and, and so on. But I think despite the fact that the class nature of students has changed dramatically, I think we have to say there is a distinction and a difference um, between students and workers in terms of the way in which we impact on society and the way in which we try and influence society around us and the power that we have inside of, inside of society as well. And so we would say students aren't the same as workers in that sense. And I think it's important to look at that because obviously for Marxists, you know, because we do look to the working class as being the key sort of agent, agent of change, the key factor of change inside of, in, inside of capitalism, it's important to have a little bit of a sudden understanding of, of how, we, how we understand class and also therefore how we understand students inside of, in, inside of our society as well. Because we don't look at working class or class just as being just the background that you were born into, for example, or just what you watch on TV or any of these sorts of lifestyle choices. Is. For Marxists, class is really an economic and social relationship. People exist in relation to each other and in relation to the system and the means of production and the, and the relationship um, of production inside of, inside of society. The reason why we look towards the working class is obviously because we see the working class as having economic power. You know, because at the point of production, they have the, they are the ones that have the ability to stop the profits being made by the capitalist, profit being the key motor of accumulation and the key drive inside of capitalism. That's why we look towards workers as being the people who can be the, the key agents of change. And also, because I think as well, because people are brought together collectively at the point of production, we also see a possibility that when people do engage in collective struggle, they can overcome some of the divisions that are put inside of our society. They can overcome things like oppression in terms of overcoming sexism as a division, racism as a divide amongst people, and, and so on as well. And so we have the possibility not only just to take on the, way, the economic and social situation of the, of, of the system, but politically the way in which people can develop through struggle means they can take on the capitalist class, um, capitalist class as a whole. And therefore, for students, you don't have the same power as workers. You don't have an economic power where you can actually, you know, strike and bring the system to a standstill. I mean, even if you're a student that works, you know, you might work, there's a couple of students at the Manchester event last week who worked in the supermarkets, for example. And when they're at work, they can organise with Usdor, they're members of Usdor, they can do that. But actually, when they come back into a university setting, it's almost like the two worlds are just not going to meet. Still, the way in which you try and put pressure inside of a, a university or an educational institution, you are exercising really a political power, if you like, as opposed to, as opposed to an, economic, an economic power. And you know, when you think about really, therefore, what is a student's class position? And I would say it's a transitory one. You don't really have a specific class position. Because even if you come from working class background, when you go to university, you will meet people who come from various different class backgrounds to yourself. Actually, at that point in university, you can have very similar interests to each other. You know, and where you're going to go next in terms of your class position when you leave university, it hasn't been determined yet. So you're definitely in a really transitory stage. And I have to say, I do remember like, when I was at working in uh, the, one of my last jobs, a youth worker in Waltham Forest, and I was a, a shop steward for Unison. Um, in, that, in, my, in my local government Unison branch. And I really remember the day that I was sat in a sort of meeting with management and they brought a new manager in to sit opposite us who was now running my department and she was somebody I'd sat on the NUS National Executive with. Mm -hmm. You know, and she was a Labour student at the time, but she went into management and there was I still part of as a shop steward. Actually, at the point at which we were together in NUS, our interests were absolutely identical, really, in terms of trying to stop fees, trying to keep grants and all the rest of it. Actually, our class position wasn't determined, but by the time we left university, went into work, you could see the differences, really, in terms of then our class positions um, uh, within, within, inside of, within inside of, uh, um, it, within inside the workplace. So, and it's not to say that you don't have you know, hierarchies or stratifications within inside universities because clearly, you know, the way the examination and assessment system works, this is about filtering out students, isn't it? The best ones or whatever that might have the chances to go on and get the best jobs uh, and all that sort of business. Um, but, um, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, but 
And so there are ways in which you can see the influence of capitalism in terms of competition and so on that's brought into the system in terms of the way in which you're forced to compete with fellow students as opposed to collectively cooperate, which I think would be the most natural and normal thing that you would say for education and learning was cooperation with people. Now, they still pit people against each other and they still introduce competition into the system um, and so on as well. But it's not really obviously... Um, the, the, the same situation um, as it has uh, you have when you're when, when you're at work as well, and I suppose the thing is as well about having that sense of political power, and not being subject to the same discipline that you are when you're at work and so on as well. It means that actually student movements can be much more spontaneous. You know, we're not confined by the same things. I mean, if you look at Sussex University at the moment. Yes, there are three occupations taking place at Sussex University, but it's not the majority of students that are involved in that. You know, thanks. And there's no way that you would have a situation inside of work where as a minority you would just strike and shut down a workplace. You have to win the majority in order to do that. So you are in a very different position, I think, as a student in terms of being able to, being able to influence, um, influence struggle. Um, so... That's what I think as well then, is that ability to be spontaneous, the ability to sort of organise in a political way, is what has led to students playing a key role in, in, in the struggle. So France in 1968, I mean, you know, it, it was over an issue of people having single-sex dormitories, for God's sake. I mean, who would have thought that, that would have led to the biggest general strike in history? same-sex dorms, you know, but actually because people were going to be disciplined from going one to one dormitory to another, the students quite rightly reacted against it. They were against the conservatism of the time that told them this is how they had to live. The reaction of the French state then to students meant that actually it generalised it across, across the working class in France and led to a situation in which one of the strongest post-World War leaders had to get a helicopter out of bloody France because he couldn't stay there any longer. The question of who took power was sparked off just by, you know, a very sort of simple political struggle um, and so I just think therefore as well when you think about Millbank and you think about the impact that Millbank had here again the ability of students actually I mean it was such an infectious thing to see Millbank happening I think for all of us who had been waiting for so long for some type of breakthrough this was like a breath of fresh air to see this happening and look at the impact it had. I don't think the de TUC demonstration on March that of the next year would have been anywhere near the size it was if it hadn't have been for the student struggle that took place that took place at Millbank. And so, even though you see a rise and fall of the movement very quickly, when that movement does go on the rise, actually it can be an incredible movement that can really spark off uh, a whole number of things. But of course, then you have the fall of the movements, which can also be quick. You know, they can get, like people say, up like a rocket, down like a stick, you know. So I think for students today then as well, you are starting to see that a massive politicisation of people, but not a generalised struggle in that sense. It's not the struggles aren't taking place, because otherwise we wouldn't have Sussex University occupation. We wouldn't have UE people fighting against course closures and so on. And also, I think as well, I mean, the political protest that placed against the Israeli ambassador on Essex University, for example, you know, all these different things, I think you can see people can engage in a lot of these political struggles and engage in campaigns with people, but at the moment, they're, they're, they're not generalised. And therefore, I think if you're a socialist on campus or if you want to see resistance on campus, you're relating much more at the moment to a, pol a wider politicised student uh, population but isn't one that necessarily is, is engaged in, 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 uh, in massive activism. So I just think, you know, whenever there are signs of resistance, you know, and also when you think about, you know, our campuses are not just progressive places, are they? You think of the levels of sexism on campus, sometimes there can be places of real reaction as well. So there are a lot of things, I think, that students can be um, a, part of, a, part of, a part of campaigning around as well. So I think, you know, again, for socialists on the campus at the moment, you know, May 1968 and all those student struggles I think are real indications of the fact that students can have a big impact on politics and a big impact on the society uh, on the society around them but I think as well that at the moment what we're trying to win people to really is a sense of how you do resist, a sense of actually a sense of revolutionary politics, winning people to Marxist politics, winning people to the idea that the working class can be the agent of change, and the political struggles that people engage in can be a part of introducing them to some of those ideas, and I think building a current, which actually means that you know, we can start more to generalise those struggles out. Can we get Sussex University occupation to spread? Can we get solidarity protests taking place? You can bet your bottom dollar that the main people that will be pushing that on any of the campuses will be people who are socialist students and who are ones with a much wider sense of, of how we change society and not just the political sense in which they're engaging at the time. Mm -hmm.
<coughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Joe. We're gonna... I'm actually, I'm, I'm interested in the Justice for Cleaners movement here at SOAS. Mm. The thing is, the reason I haven't sort of delayed myself a bit there, I actually, I don't know, I'm not too sure which question, how to turn this into a question to ask you. Mm. Um, but are you, are, are you familiar with the Justice for Cleaners movement? At all. Yeah, um, I'm not to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is going on here at SOAS. I mean, there's, there's justice for cleaners movements at sort of universities. I mean, I guess probably all around the world and other institutions. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm sort of trying to think, think of ways to mobilise the sort of the, the, the students at SOAS because there's, there's like five thousand students. Mm -hmm. There's only one Paul Webberly, you know, the director. And even though he, <laughs> he, you know, he's, he's the guy who sort of can make the decision to sort of hire an in house, but actually the power quite clearly lies with the students. Because if there's five thousand of us, if we um, kind of do the right, kind of come together in the right way, then we can clearly influence him. But it's a question about how we do that. Mm. Like, what is the right form of collective action? Mm. Um, you know, what, at what point is he going to sort of change his? Is he going to change his mind? Is he going to? At what, what point does he become more influenced by the students and less by his sort of peers and you know, the other directors of the other universities? Um, and how actually do we get the students on board with the idea? Because there's so many of them, and I thought that so as people would be more engaged with politics, but it seems they're um, more interested in doing the Harlem Shake. Um, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, like I, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't had the history of SOAS um, collective actions, but I wouldn't be surprised if this, the, this was SOAS non non Harlem shape, shape as they could have it, that happened on what? Monday. That might have been like the biggest collective action. You know what happened? Tell us. They, so someone, I mean, to, does anyone know about the Harlem Shake? No. <laughs> what? You don't know about the Harlem Shake? No, tell me, tell me. No, it's good. You should be happy with it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well. It's a good, it's a good dance move. To be fair. Yeah. Um, well, someone. So this is. Uh, it was. Um, uh, uh, there's a style of music called trap music. It's kind of like dubstep, but a bit more like hip hop. It's yeah. all made a tune called the Harlem Shake, and then yeah. all these videos started sprouting up with people doing this dance. Uh, there is actually a dance called the Harlem Shake. Yeah, which but comes from Harlem. Yeah, yeah that's right. Which I know about the dance, they, but what relevance is it here? Yeah. No, basically it's like an actual dance mm. and then I think there's an element of racism in that whole like sprang of like the Harlem Shake thing where you see people basically almost taking the piss out of the Harlem Shake where it actually okay. has political and social roots yeah. that originate from Harlem. We have people like not really understanding those and trying to like imitate them, and it's so as being politically progressive, they called it the non Harlem shape. Oh. So not to tag themselves, but they. But only, only after a few people complained on the Facebook page. Yeah. So they called it yeah. not the non. So the they still they wanted to dance it and take the piss out of it, but to be politically correct whilst doing it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but not so <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, so it was on Monday and about I think well on the Facebook event they managed to invite about somewhere between a thousand and two thousand people, which is quite a lot considering for the, the, the there's only about hundred and fifty likes for the size cleaners movement page. And um, about four hundred people said they were attending and I think in the end actually on the ground about two maybe a hundred 50 people were actually there, sort of outside the steps, doing the dance, and plus loads of people, maybe like 50, 100 people, sort of uh, looking and, and, and taking videos with, with their camera, with, with their phones. Um, and so it was just, it was, you know, it was impressive to, to see people having been brought together, but just the, just the way, like, not only, I mean, people said, oh, look, we're just trying to have fun, and I was saying, well, why don't you have to try and have fun and do something good with it at the same time? Um, and people, pe people were quite. They they took their fun quite seriously. Like that, they were like, no, 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 no. We don't. We just want to have fun, and, and, and we just want to do it ju just for fun, and it doesn't have to be political. And I'm like, well, that's. You can't avoid. You can't just do something for fun. You know, yeah. it's, it's it, not only is it the potential for harm for the Harlem community, it's also distracting people. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Go on, far away. Yeah, um, I think actually the um, 
the Justice for Cleaners campaign is one of the most interesting in central London, actually. Um, and it's one of the campaigns that had the most success uh, throughout throughout the years. It's been it's been there for, for years and it has managed to actually um, win some victories for, for, for the cleaners that mm -hmm. most of them are international cleaners um, that come mostly from like Latin America and so on. Um, and I think the, and, and it's true that previ in previous years there was more agitation around the, uh, around the issue, and that SOAS was uh, politic. The, the student population was, was politicized and was part of that campaign. The politicization of the student body uh, was not an abstract from the existence of an agitation of an agitating group on campus uh, that was highly politicized and was agitating and bringing and and kind of and uh, affirming the need for unity between uh, the workers who, you know, their rights and, and the students and, and struggling together. Because any struggle that you're going to have on campus, you're going to have to have to find a way between uniting uh, the work, whether be it around like fees, you need to bring your lecturers in and, and the students. I don't think students, because of their social role, because of their position in society, they can't win struggles by themselves. I mean, if we saw that around the struggle of the fees and how hard we fought, but we didn't have on board as much, you know, our lecturers and our departments and all of that uh, uh, on board. And I think if we did, we'd be in a, we'd, this, we would have been in a different uh, uh, reality. So I think there was a need to combine both of those uh, struggles uh, together, you know, the revolt of the students and their outrage and their energy and all of that, but also the power of the workers to actually change things. Um, so I think, you know, and that is, and that is what's needed and that's how um, the, the campaign, the Justice for London Cleaners uh, campaign has actually managed to win a lot of its, a lot of its uh, victories by bringing the students and, and, and the workers uh, uh, together. And I think they'll kind of, I mean, I studied at SOAS as well, so I think I know a bit about this. But like the, um, the lack of engagement of students, I think, in, in, in that campaign in itself is not because they're just apathetic or that they're just, you know, students just want to have fun and so on. Uh, it is true that SOAS is a bit of a weird campus. It's, you know, characterized as radical without actually being radical. But there are um, people on, on campus that do actually want to fight these things. I think that what's the, the missing link that has been at SOAS for such a long time, uh, for, for a few years really, I think, is the existence of, 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 um, of an actual agitational group that can actually politically agitate, link, make those links uh, uh, um, that will be consistently present on campus, you know, be it with the cleaners, be it with the fees, be it with all of these things that can constantly present an ideological, uh, an ideological argument for the need to link uh, the workers and the, and the students together, and I think that is really missing at SOAS. So, so you're saying like one, like whether it's a society or some group, to unite all the different societies or... or no, but it's, it's, a, political, it's a political strategy and yeah. a political ideology that you, 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 you represent, and that is not present on SOAS campus today. I mean, the, the level of politics within the student body as societies and so on is not, mm. is not really there anymore. Uh, whereas it used to it used to exist in the past, and I think that was a really important element within it. Yeah, <coughs> far away. Yeah, sort of to, just following on really from what Raya said. I mean, I think principally the thing is that you know is is the workers in in the justice for for cleaners campaign who are the ones that have the power. You know, if the cleaners decide to stop cleaning the campus, well then that's when you guys have the has a problem on his hands. Um, and I think the same was the case with the, the, the fees thing. It, it, it's about, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's the workers, and, and Joe sort of talks about this, it's the workers who actually have the power to sort of bring the universities or the streets or whatever to, to a standstill. But that's not to underestimate the, the potential that the students can play. We've seen that, we saw that with, with Millbank, the way that, you know, it was. There, was, there were people who were upset and, and, and angry about austerity, but it wasn't until Milbank that I think, you know, trade unionists were, were sort of inspired, I suppose, or, or, or driven to then take, you know, a series of strike actions afterwards. So, and, and I think that's something we see playing out all the time, like the, the students sort of provide the inspiration and the force and all of that sort of stuff. But ultimately, the, those things take effect because, because workers 
come alongside. And so, of course, when Milkbank happened, UCU were on strike that day as well, and they were involved in that. So these the students led the storming of Milbank. Um, but but it, it was organised workers who sort of were able to follow through with strikes around the pensions and the rest of it. Um, moving moving on from that, and, and I think I think that picking up the point that that Rai is making, like around the fees, I think that the political the, the need for politics there is, is is about saying to to lecturers, for example, you know, the introduction of fees is part of exactly the same corporatisation that's going on. That means that you're being casualised. That means that you're being put. Uh, made to work for, um, you know, what's it called? You know, lectures are more and more forced to work for results. Like they have, they have to publish, and there are all sorts of yeah. sort of pressures about measuring how how well they're contributing to to their departments, and 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 you know, the, the pressure on universities to bring in more funding, more international students, all of that sort of thing. That that's where the politics comes in, being able to explain, you know, why those are the same things, and, and, and bringing the workers in the university, whether they be cleaners or lecturers, on board in those things. But you know, I think the question you asked about the Harlem um, shake is an interesting one because because there's a question we're all trying to deal with is people who want to change things, isn't it? Like, how do you mobilise people? How do you get people to be interested in changing things? And in, and, all, and the, the simple thing to say is well. It's easy to get people to commit to come out and do a flash mob and shake around a little bit. It's, it's a lot more difficult to, to argue with people, to, to, to be committed to come and put yourself a bit on the line around a campaign or to occupy a university and that sort of thing. Um, I suppose that's, the, you know, that's why those of us who are in the social workers party, part of the political party, we see the need to have this constant intervention with people around arguing these things. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, yeah, Benjamin's again. I mean, student politics is extremely weird. I think that's that's the first thing we have to say. I mean, it, you know, it, because precisely, if, if you get a strike movement or if you get a, a, um, workers coming out and organise, say, so you need a you need to win the majority, but B largely it actually focuses around immediate demands on this. You know, the, the boss treating uh, treating the workers badly, sacking uh, uh, sackings, mass sackings, wage cuts, etc. Whereas with students, partly because of the, the analysis you gave of the, the kind, of, kind of strange class position of the student, it's slightly different. I mean, if you look at the big uh, mobilizations over the past 10 years of the student movement, the really big ones, I mean, there's also the question of the Iraq war, the Gaza, and the, 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 these, these people are not, it's not about you know, you're getting hit by the employer, therefore you strike back. It's actually something. Uh, you know, either looking, looking after solidarity with people in other countries, or even even with Milbank, a lot of the students there wouldn't be directly affected by the fee shift because they're already in university. That's coming in, so they're looking out for future generations. So I think that gives us something about it tells us something about the nature of student politics, which you've kind of alluded to, given this transitory phase that people are in in their lives. But for me, I think that has political implications in the sense that primarily student politics is about ideas, and I think it's actually about precisely. Uh, um, trying to give across some kind of coherent world view to the majority of students who will be, for the first time in your life, as you said, have time to read, mm -hmm. have time to think. They're not to the rigor of, 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 of work day in, day out. They will be, if, they, if they're going to be successful uh, academics or whatever these days, they will be uh, coming across Marx, they will be coming across Schumpeter, Keynes, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think that's the role of, of course, I mean, I agree with the, the, the two female companies, you know, organization, the privacy of organizational campus, but it's also about what we're trying to bring and the, the message we're trying to, we're trying to imbue, because it, it is, as I say, it is, it is a weird thing, student politics. It's not, uh, as, as, as the, as the comment at London, they talk, it's, 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 there are different dynamics to it. I, I can't remember the exact analogy, but it's, what's the thing, is it a barometer when you when you see that the storm's coming? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like that, it, not necessarily, but often students are the first to, to, first to move or express it in, in some way. But, but I think that the, the, the fundamental point is, you know, students can only reflect in that sense what's outside it. And that is the question of, of socialist organization and what's around it, because obviously with, with a week, I mean, like 68 in Paris, Okay, it's about sex and, and single sex dorms and the rest of it, but you do have a massive French workers movement that comes like to 10 million general strike. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it, it, so it, it's, a, it, it's a reflection. Uh, it, it blows in the wind, if you like, of, of society, but, it's, but, but it's, it also can't be torn, up, torn apart from that. I think that does lead us to, uh, uh, to uh, for me, it's certainly to emphasize the role of, of ideas and clarifying Marxism, which I think, as a student, you, you, you're generally looking for an understanding of the world. You're at university, which is and I'm definitely for going back to um, 
the kind of elite education of you know sitting around and talking for hours and debating and, 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 and studying the classics. I think that's absolutely that should be the right of every working class kid. Because I certainly didn't do Latin in, in South Wales, <laughs> you know. But I think that's precisely the kind of education that we should be looking for. It's precisely what you know what what the bourgeoisie is uh, trying is trying to give for itself. We should actually have for uh, for for the mass of people in society, which is a, a rounded, uh, steep culture education. Just anecdotally on that, I mean, to talk about weird, uh, I studied at Bonn University, uh, where Karl Marx studied, and uh, if you, uh, <laughs> if you, if you, if you, if you, you talk about like, you know, aristocrats and, and elites, right? Karl Marx, uh, the student societies used to belong to, the fencing clubs and all the rest of it, go to Bonn University and see where, <laughs> again, an extremely privileged education, but through, precisely through that, um, generalised the, the lessons of world history and, and set down for the working class. So I think the, the, the better education our class gets, the more around it, the stronger we are as well. But that also, we can't just rely on the university for that. That's why you're meetings like this, and that's as well, it's about our own strength. But I, I, I do think we need to, I say, locate the, the kind of strange uh, aspect of student politics, which isn't about wages and fees in that sense. It's actually about much, much more. Yeah. <coughs> but anyone else? Not the harm, shake. Got a hard look shade. I'm gonna do it now. That's actually quite a Marxist critique of the Harlem shake. <laughs> I'm not you, Jake. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we would do it actually. We do that. I just wanted to. Is it about a point you made earlier um, about the, for example, the cleaners and they're then having a the power because they can, you know, do it. They can strike. And then, but, but the problem is, is just. I mean, this is this is specifically in relation to the government. This was SOAS. Um, if they strike, uh, that affects the the private company that hires them, um, and they probably just get sacked. And the new workers will come in. SOAS has no responsibility to them. That's the problem. That's why, in this particular instance, I think what I think is the case with not quite many institutions where they outsource their workers. The workers really have li quite little power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I think in this instance it is it is really about the, the students, and it is the work. It's the work that give them the inspiration to do it. But I think um, so. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that point. Mm -hmm. Did someone else want to respond? No, you should. You should. Speak. I should. Okay. Well, like you've, you've offered. <laughs> I mean, I think that. That's a more generalised argument that gets used a lot with sort of casualised workers and, and, and with outsourcing and all of that sort of and, and it's true. I mean, it's absolutely true, especially these particular workers. They're very vulnerable mm -hmm. in the sense that lots of them are migrant workers, they're really low paid workers. There's a lot of people out there who are unemployed that could that could probably just be used to replace replace them. Um, but I think that that's not a reason not for those organisers not to or for those workers not to organise and to try and protect their their work. Um, and, and it's also an argument for why different sections of workers should should and can try and work together. For example, at Queen Mary University mm. there was also a campaign around the cleaners and it was supported by the staff at the UCU. And what happened was the cleaner the cleaning contract was brought back in house because yeah. of pressures mm -hmm. from the UCU. So this is exactly the kind of model that you know you'd want to try and push for if you want to win justice for cleaners on this campus. That's the kind of the, you know so, so, so that was the with Queen Mary's that was mainly yeah. the workers who sort of achieved it, it that was, it was a combination I think of, of the workers themselves. Because because there are you know within the Justice for Cleaners campaign there are there are um, uh, union organisers, I think somebody might be able to tell me which, I think is it you not? Yeah, yeah probably it's 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 so, so they are, you know, and, and there's pretty serious <coughs> union organisers mm. who are trying to organise those workers and, and then in this case it was it was a combined campaign that joined up the different workers and the students together and I think that's I think it's a really, really good example mm. actually of how it undercut some of that stuff around, you know, workers being made vulnerable is by joining up with with other workers who have industrial strength. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask a question merely out of ignorance. <laughs> but, um, because the analysis that we're talking about of students is like up like a rocket and down like a stick and the, the lack of um, the lack of power to achieve political constitutes the lack of economic power which they hold. 
but obviously the aberration here is Quebec, where the movement went on for a long period of time and won its political demands despite the fact that it was, for whatever, for whatever reason, never became rooted in the working class. Mm. Um, so I was wondering, is this just a case of like tradition? Is it a case of the forms of organisation that have been used in the universities there, or is it something else about the political situation? Mm. I think like with an analysis of Quebec, it's important to, to go, but the devil's in the detail in that sense. So this is not the first Victoria Stephen student movement in Quebec. There's been mm. like decades and decades of of of, uh, of struggle, and I think also the nature of where the organisation of, particularly in the most recent example, where the organisation of, of the strikes came from, they were embedded in departments. I think that's something that's quite different like, from Essex, and most of the political organising that we did was far away from the departments, far away from the lecturers or classes, usually in the communal areas and the squares. Uh, in this case, it was in the departments with consultation and discussion with, with lecturers and administration staff. Like, one of the things that even if you bring it down away from a political level to a really kind of like detailed level. One of the reasons that the strikes could go on for so long, obviously the size of them meant that it was difficult for disciplinaries, etc., to be administered. But there was also the, the refusal of staff members to implement possible disciplinaries and to, and to create the, the facilitate the ability for almost a whole year of uh, classes to be boycotted not, uh, of, of occupation for the process of exams not to be uh, not to be taken, but still for a student to not have that negatively impact on their on their record. For example, I know, so it's not necessarily the same in terms of that the workers emphasising economic power, but there was definitely an extent to which um, there were relationships, uh, maybe not classic relationships, and no, not in the same way in terms of it turning into a workers' movement as it was in France 68 um, or other examples, but clearly there was a, there was a relationship between, um, the stu between students and maybe not a workers' movement, but workers' yeah, support yeah, yeah. For, 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 for that. So I think that's something that um, maybe goes some way to explain your question. Uh, the other thing I wanted to raise was that I understand, I, I, and I agree with what with Joe would say in terms of like, the, the class related, the class position of of students, but one of the things that concerns me is how do we get away from a situation uh, from, and you can, you, can, you can imagine this coming to pass, where students are simply propagandist water, water carriers. Mm -hmm. So they wait around for a workers' movement to not, or wait around for some kind of workers' struggle to relate to, um, while at the same time talking abstractly about politics on, on, on campuses. I think that's something that needs to be. Um, Really looked into and articulated, so we don't we don't as an organisation fall fall in, into that into that trap. Um, how do we make, maintain um, relations between uh, workers and students outside of times in which there is actual struggle to orientate around? Because I think what what we've done well as 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 the SWP is to relate very keenly and quite sharply towards struggle when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, how do we maintain that outside of a situation in which there's not a picket line to go to? Example. Yeah. Um, and then um, the other thing I wanted to raise is about uh, the kind of action that students take. If if we're talking about obviously the thing about student movements is that they're unpredictable. You don't know what the road or what the next flashpoint is going to be. Uh, so in that sense, there's almost uh, a difficulty in reticence of what kind of action do we take. Okay, we don't want another. We don't want to. We, we know that the the route to an enlarged student movement is not another mill back. Uh, but to what extent does us talking about not another mill bank possibly close off avenues to kind of struggle or kind of mm. political action that would, over, over a certain example, uh, create some kind of some kind of movement? So I would like, you know, obviously, yeah. we would need to have that argument over a much longer period, uh, not just in this meeting, but if, if, if we are reaffirming what we mean by student movements mm. with the honest defeat of the stuff around cuts and fees. Mm. Um, how, how do we do that that doesn't fall into those possible pitfalls? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose just coming back to this thing about the um, justice for the cleaners and stuff as well, because, um, I mean, I think when you think about what the 
um, Sussex occupation is about. It's about the outsourcing of 235 jobs there as well. And I mean, the last place that I was working at Amnesty, they were trying to outsource some key parts of our service as well. And one of the ways in which outsourcing fits at the moment for the capitalist class is because very much it's always about headcount now in terms of the number of staff that you actually employ and the levels of sort of fixed, um, the amounts of money that you have to put towards each individual contract and stuff like that. So one of the things which outsourcing does for the bosses is it means that they can just give a, a set of money to this company who can then employ people on much worse terms and conditions. Let's not forget it, because what they do is, is they put a bid in, they, they, want to, they come in at the lowest bids. The way in which they then deliver that is by crap, you know, really cutting back on workers' terms and, terms and conditions. So it is a part of a whole sort of neoliberal drive around flexibility with inside the workforce, about driving down people's terms and conditions. So I think it's possible to generalise out to students the links between the neoliberal agenda in terms of austerity, in terms of what's happened with the EMA and fees, and then what's also taking place in terms of people's employment and why outsourcing is now the flavour of the day. And then there's a whole number of different examples where because when you outsource, you usually get back actually a much worse service than when you have it in-house. Unison have written plenty of copious material on how to bring services back in-house as well. But for those workers that are involved in that, one of the reasons why I would also say it would be important for those workers to struggle and to go on strike and so on is because until you actually put yourself out there, get in solidarity for that because there will be a big question then for UCU members at SOAS, are they going to cross a picket line? by cleaners at their own institution. Are they going to do that? Are the other Unison work members within SOAS, the other administrative staff and so on, are they also going to cross a picket line of Unison in their own institution? Actually, it raises a much bigger qu question for people as to what they, what they then do. But the cleaners have to be quite decisive over that in terms of actually how they decided to take that type of action. But certainly, we would, I think you can sometimes you can strike out on your own sometimes because then it forces a situation in which you, you are calling people to then back you up and, and, to, and, and to support you as well. So, and then, you know, I mean, this whole thing about the sort of Harlem shake and stuff like that. And I mean, really, you know, um, I think escapism and stuff has always been quite a big part of student life as well. I mean, you know, dope smoking at university, you know, I mean, when they talk about some of the hippie stuff during the 1960s, there's an element of truth to that, do you know what I mean, that some people did do that. And so therefore you do have a situation in which even when you go into university, which is supposed to be a liberating experience, actually people do search for escapism as well. So you can see two responses to the pressures of the system on people. Um, and I suppose there's a big question always, isn't there, about is it that people are just apathetic, you know, or they just don't care about things? But I think, you know, there's always that slogan, isn't there, that power corrupts. But I think powerlessness corrupts absolutely almost more than power does in the sense of when you don't feel like you can actually make an impact on anything, when you don't really feel like you, you, you can make a change or the official channels of how you make changes seem to be the only ones available to you, what is the point in doing that? You may as well just have a bloody good time and drop out, do you know what I mean? So there are different pressures on people because of the way in which the system is. But I think, you know, you can, you can mitigate against some of those things sometimes in terms of combining, you know, some action for the cleaners which might involve a non-Harlem shake. I mean, who knows? But you can find different avenues and ways into things, can't you, that can be a bit creative about stuff as well. So I think it's possible to, to to, to engage people in that in that way as well. But I suppose that's about the expression of ideas inside of society, isn't it? And you know, of course, as Marxists, we would say the ideas are the ideas of the ruling class. They're the sort of predominant ideas inside of society. It's revolutionaries that have come up against that a lot of the time when they're trying to fight uh, for, for their ideas as well. And I think that's the thing about you know the when we're talking about ideas on campuses and about you know what do you do as a student when there aren't. Uh, picket lines and stuff like that taking place and I mean I have to say my, my time at university in the 1990s it wasn't characterised by a series of strikes it just wasn't, there weren't any strikes really taking place then to be honest we were involved in the criminal justice bill movement we were involved in the anti-Nazi league I mean we were involved in you know, we, we, we boycott one of, the, one of our university sponsored nightclubs there was a racist attack on one of our students down there, within a week we organised a 500 strong boycott of that nightclub and so on and you know we, we made a difference, you know, political power is important. It's not just that 
We just, we just fight for unity only with the working class of students. We have to fight for ourselves to have a sense of political power and trying to enact that and put that into place as well around various different campaigns. I think we have to do that. And I think you're right, these things come up at different, at different times. You never know what's going to come up next. You don't know when the next time the Israeli ambassador is going to come to your campus or Marine Le Pen is going to be invited to speak at the Cambridge Union Debating Society. And all of a sudden, on your hands, you have a struggle to fight back with, you know, you're trying to launch broad united front campaigns against fascism, you're trying to link different campaigns on the liberation for Palestine and of course inside of universities now, you know, when you think about the occupations that happened around Gaza back in 2009, you think about the politicisation that's taken place of people all the way back to when people went out on strike over the, the starting of the war inside of Iraq, there is a massive political impact that students have in their own right. We don't always have to say that it's only about linking up with worker struggles. I don't think that would be true at all. I think it would be a real disservice to what students can do and what they can achieve by themselves and in their own rights. And so the thing about the movements being up like rockets and down like sticks, you know, I suppose that's partly about, it doesn't mean that they are always just short term in that sense, because I think the Quebec thing and some of the struggles that we had around some of the grants stuff and the rest of it, they happened over a period of years, you know. The thing what I think about up like a rocket and down the stick is more referring to is the way in which students can be much freer to suddenly engage with different political movements, with occupations and so on as well, and take those sorts of ideas, those sorts of ideas on as well. So so I do think there is a, it is a sense of agitating around ideas as well inside the universities. I mean, certainly like, you know, the one thing that we used to really organise against was postmodernism. You know, that was the order of the day in, ni in, the 19, in the 1990s. You know, identity and lifestyle politics was the order of the day. This isn't the precursor to the anti-capitalist movement. You know, in the run up to Seattle in 1999, we were trying to fight back against the, the, the idea of you couldn't have a grand narrative, you couldn't talk about this system in a sense, you couldn't talk about truth, you couldn't talk about reality. Everything was a reality if that's what you believed. And so we had to wage a real ideological war on our campus against postmodernism, against post feminism. And I think those struggles are important. I think we should challenge the bloody ruling ideas inside of our society. We should put up the contradictions of them. We don't just accept the lecturers are gods in terms of delivering us from on high, their interpretation and their ideas. We actually can challenge those ideas. And I think if you're a socialist inside a university, I think challenging your lectures, I think it's just a brilliant thing to be able to do. I think people should do it. And then after they do it, I think they should be selling people a copy of The Socialist Worker, do you know what I mean? And identifying where they're coming from and why they're challenging them, and that they do have an alternative vision and an alternative understanding of the world. Because I think it's because people can engage in those things, it opens the prospects for us to raise those sorts of questions. What sort of education do we want? You know, when you look at actually how some school students have shaped their education in times of massive struggle, they set the curriculum. They say to the teachers, in collective and demo democratic processes, this is what we want you to, to teach us. This is what we want to bring to This is how we want to learn. We don't want to be tested in this way every single time and have that determine whether we're good or bad students in that sense. So people, I think, can challenge some of the most basic forms of measure and, and, um, and hierarchy within capitalism when they're at university. And an ideological and political struggle in its own right is bloody valid. And it's something that we should be engaging with massively, not just in terms of building red bases that we then go out into the workplaces and or recruit. No, not in that sense. Political struggles have their own place and they should be fought and they're important to be, to be won as well. So, but because of part of that, we can start to bring up the questions and the debates around the agency of change. We can win people to be a Marxist. We can win people to the idea that we can actually overthrow the whole system. If we can occupy Sussex, look at what's happening in their occupation. And it happens in every occupation. Students start to organise themselves in a way inside that occupation, which means they suddenly think, well, maybe I could organise a little bit better than just going to university. Maybe I don't have to just be confined by the roles that the system has ascribed to me. Maybe we can organise the lectures on this campus. We did that at the University of East London. We had food committees. We had committees to look after the bloody ducks that were in the pond. Outs. We had committees for everything there. We organised on a collective basis that every part of our existence on every part of the day. And I think those things are worth it because it gives you a glimpse and an idea of restructuring society in a way that actually benefits everybody and is really about ideas and not is constrained by the bloody, you know, the, well, the way in which this system wants to stratify us and keep us in place. So political struggle is everything to play for inside the campus. We don't have to wait for the picket lines. We can do things in our own right, and we should.